Well, I, I hope, uh, I, uh, Tony, that I, that I can enlighten some of, uh, some of the folks on this. Um, you know, it won't surprise you. We're talking about silos. We're talking about um, different organizations. Uh, it's very competitive in the U.S., you know, among agencies. Um, uh, right after the, um, the crisis, the 2008 crisis, the CFTC and the SEC were talked about being put together. You know, it, it really makes sense, frankly. You know, the reason they aren't put together is political. You know, we have a committee called the Agricultural Committee, both in the Senate and, and the House, who likes having jurisdiction, and I'm looking over here, <laughs> uh, over a particular agency like uh, the CFTC. So that didn't happen. And, um, you know, there's not, you know, Gary Gensler, now Mary Jo White, uh, don't sit together in a room and work out how should we all do this in a harmonious way. You know, they have their own constituents. They have their own uh, views. And... Um, you know, it just it just happens that way. It's I mean, I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but it's not a coordinated effort among the different uh, regulatory agencies. But I can I can come back to that. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. I, I, uh, Ex-regulators uh, generally end up in the uh, you know the uh, trash bins of uh, you know s different places, and, and we turn up occasionally. And um, it's, um, it's nice uh, to be able to see a, a community uh, like this looking and thinking very hard about regulation, something that I was very involved with for uh, my five years as a commissioner. In 2002, when I first became a commissioner, no one at the commission, none, none of the other commissioners were interested in doing international work. You know, I said, what for? You know, we're, we're the SEC, we, you know, we'll just make our own rules here. And uh, I uh, said, well, maybe I'm naive, but I think there's something out there in the, in the global, and I'm willing to travel, so I'll, I'll do that. And, um, and sure enough, uh, my first effort, you know, in the international community uh, had to do to defend Sarbanes-Oxley. Remember Sarbanes-Oxley? I mean, it seems like such a long time ago, you know, when, when uh, regulatory issues were simple. You know, we had... Uh, executives, CFOs, and their auditors essentially lying about the financial statements and, and making up sales that didn't exist. So we had Sarbanes-Oxley, and it was very straightforward to prosecute different executives for plain, straightforward fraud. Uh, and Europe was initially very upset with the SEC. And, 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 and America in general, because, you know, as it tends to be, uh, because how dare, you know, the SEC and, and Congress impose the PCAOB and its extraterritoriality, right, in which the PCAOB was now claiming that it could force foreign auditors and foreign, uh, even lawyers, under its particular jurisdiction. So anyway... Um, it took a while to explain that that was unintentional, that uh, Congress acted quickly. Uh, there was huge pressure to bring these scoundrels uh, into, um, in, into justice, and Sarbanes-Oxley was, was a result of it. Uh, but again, it, it seems quaint now in retrospect, right? Uh, these, these problems seem to be fairly straightforward now and much you know, overwhelmed by, by the 2008 uh, um, uh, the 2008 scandal and, uh, and, and recession. Essentially, it's interesting, the PCAOB today is seeking to figure out how to deal with working papers in other jurisdictions. So we still have extraterritoriality, and this has to do with uh, foreign issuers, say China in, in, in recent days, listing in the U.S. and then having a problem with their disclosures, and how do you how do you uh, go back to China and deal with uh, auditors in China uh, and having a government that doesn't particularly want to uh, accommodate that sort of thing? So, you know, there, there are things like that and um, uh, that, that still exist as a result uh, of Sarbanes-Oxley and, and the imperfections in terms of still trying to impose uh, the PCAOB. Uh, Olivier mentioned... Um, you know, uh, IFRS, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm rather proud that in my time we got uh, foreign registrants to be able to use IFRS when they list, you know. Maybe it wasn't the same as the U.S. 
uh, accepting IFRS in full, but essentially, you know, IFRS today in, in the United States is fully used, fully utilized, and essentially we have the two, the two standards being used. Uh, it's political in terms of why the U.S. doesn't and, and the SEC doesn't formally adopt IFRS. It has to do with certain elements claiming that uh, there's not as much protection under IFRS, which I don't believe is true. And, um, and, and I've always uh, been a supporter of, of IFRS, and perhaps a, some sort of a compromise could be done. For example, you could let domestic companies opt in into IFRS. If they're never going to go and be a global player, uh, they can stay with uh, U.S. GAAP. Uh, again, you know, there's, there's ways to sort of figure this one out, but unfortunately, in, in the, um, you know, with, on the eve of 2008, you know, with the Great Recession, the SEC just hasn't gone forward. They're, you know, they're, they're too uh, worried about uh, doing something wrong and being criticized, and that is, that is the cl climate that involves the SEC at the moment. Uh, so let, let's look at where things stand, because, you know, in, in 2002, uh, things were very different. And let, let me bore you with a few statistics very quickly. Um, for example, in the U.S., there are today more than 950 foreign private issuers, public companies, right, that, that, uh, that are registered with the SEC to raise capital from our public securities markets. That's, that's a large number. Approximately 450 of these issuers uh, file using IFRS. You know, I, I just made that point. Uh, and that reflects also an increase with Canada, you know, going to IFRS, just to be, to be fair on the, with the numbers. Uh, foreign issuers account for approximately 22% of the capital reported raised in 2012 using Rule 506 of our Regulation D. Uh, so this is a private placement uh, effort. And um, uh, so we had a total of $200 billion uh, that were raised under that private placement situation by foreign uh, uh, by foreign players in the U.S. There are more than 600 foreign domiciled investment advisors which manage over $6.7 trillion in assets that are registered with the SEC. Not all that money, of course, is in the U.S., uh, as well as 90 registered and provisionally registered foreign domicile broker-dealers. Uh, in some U.S. derivative market sectors, as much as 90% of the transactions involve foreign domiciled. So, okay, not perfect, but the U.S. certainly... Uh, has accepted foreign players, uh, broker-dealers, investment advisors, uh, uh, public companies, and our markets are being accessed by uh, foreign, um, foreign players, foreign investors. And this, this is progress. In 2002, we didn't have these kinds of numbers you know, from, you know, from the time that I was there. So I, I, I take a little pride that things improved and, and things were open. Uh, that's not to say we, we are anywhere near the end. Let me make a couple of other points uh, before my time runs out. Uh, I do believe that in Europe and in Asia and, and other places, we, we have fundamentally different types of markets. The U.S. does have a very large retail market. So sometimes the interest in the, of the U.S. to protect investors has to do with small people, right? The uh, orphans and the widows and, and, um, and everyday people who have uh, accounts, 401ks we call them now, our retirement accounts, and are managed. Uh, it's less the case in Europe and Asia, not to say that you don't have a retail market, but, but it's not as large or as uh, percentage-wise. So you have a greater number of institutional investors. And as, as we heard this morning, the bank system and the banks are often uh, investors and often the suppliers of capital. In the U.S., we have a more developed not to say this, uh, that's better, it's just, it's just a characteristic. We have a more developed uh, other uh, set of capital markets players, right? So we have uh, you know, what used to be investment banks, we have broker dealers, we have shadow banking, we have all of these things. So the concept in the US and, um, is, is essentially that uh, you, in, in the risk is something to be embraced, not completely avoided. Uh, in particular with the capital markets. Banks, prudential regulation, avoid the runs on the bank. However, risk in the capital markets is appropriate. And if handled correctly, failure uh, redistributes capital and, um, and it's something that is accepted. And so I, I think as a very broad issue uh, that sometimes there is a, uh, 
um, a, a marriage of these two things in, in terms of regulatory thought and the, and the worry of safety and protection. In saying this, I'm, I'm not arguing that uh, all markets shouldn't protect against fraud and shouldn't protect against scoundrels and, and, and others. That's obviously very true and, and has to happen. But legitimate risk in terms of trying to raise capital, create uh, a new business, and having failure result is something that has to be accommodated, it seems to me.